consequently, you see our people, we are like Pavlovian dogs, and we have to face it. Where we let another people associate through music and through this and through that, various symbols, such that all they have to do is hold them up and manipulate us, and that which they have created inside of us responds to these symbols, and we cannot escape their influence. So consequently, we cannot exercise voluntary control over our emotions and over our behavior. And there are so many ways you can hypnotize people. One of the ways, of course, you can hypnotize them is through authority. Right? Yeah, see, you read hypnotism books and they tell you just, some people you can hypnotize just by literally commanding them. If they respect your authority enough, they'll just go into a hypnotic trance. That's what I tell my people in my class all the time. I tell you something you half don't want to have to leave it. White man came in here and told you, you take it all in. <laughs> the very people who've lied to you most are the people you're the quickest to believe. Hypnotism. In fact, you won't believe it until what? Until they say it. Until you see some proof or some white authority. Therefore, white skin itself becomes a symbol of authority in and of itself. An individual responds to it unconsciously and consciously. And therefore, anything connected with them gains the authority as well. So one of your colleagues go to a white college. You're ready to believe it. You went to a black college? Well, hmm. I think about what you have to say. You, oh, you got a degree from Harvard? Oh, well, all right, come in here and tell us anything you want to tell us. <laughs> you know? And therefore, the things that are connected, we respond to them. This is what we call in psychology, general, psychology generalization, right? You, you learn one thing, and, and if it's similar or related to that which you learn, mistake of getting angry and resentful in dealing with the European because it is through anger and resentment that the personality is implanted into you as a people. It is through losing control over your mind and responding senselessly that the devil is placed into you as a, as a person yourself. It is through anger and resentment that you become like the person that you are angry with and resent. Somebody calls you a fool. Who? I'm not a fool. <laughs> you demonstrate it right away. <laughs> I made you into one right off. <laughs> and so the, and, and now when they get, and now, now many of us as people are filled with anger. We are filled with rage. Hurt, fear, and anxiety. And that becomes a chronic part of our nature, which is the one of the reasons why we suffer so much from the physical ills that we do. And we are susceptible to the kind of diseases that we are susceptible to. And yet having this anger and fear and resentment in us, that anger, fear, and resentment blinds us also to reality makes us see the world in a distorted fashion. Plus it then it is, it becomes a handle by which the other people can manipulate us into doing and saying things when if we had a cooler mind we would not have done or said. And I'll speak more to this a little later on about how this anger and resentment, it makes you reject things and refuse to deal with things that should be dealt with makes you see the world backwards and see it wrong. And therefore, one of the things you do if you want to work somebody's mind often is to make them angry first. See? And then work them through their anger. 
watch me say this and watch him go off. Right. <laughs> you, know, you know, we do this in our personal relations. You get to know your woman or your man well, and you know where you can touch that nerve. And you just touch nerves all day and night, touching nerves and, and watching them jump and bounce like a baby dog. Oh, you know, string them. And therefore, even though our anger is justified as a people and the kind of experiences we've been through certainly have been scarring ones, we must still bring them under our control and not let them be under the control of another people because they're going to manipulate them and use them to their advantage time in and time again. It means then that these symbols must be looked at very closely for what they're worth and for the function that they serve. Why were the, the, the whites, both liberals and conservatives, frightened by the Muslims? Why, is, why, why, are the, why was the nation of Islam, particularly under Elijah Muhammad, such a frightening thing to these people? One of the reasons, of course, is the fact that this was not a NAACP number or an Urban League number that left what? The European symbols unmolested, you see, and left the, the whole conditioning system that they placed around us un untouched. The nation under, under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad threatened to replace what? The very symbols themselves. The very conditioning cues themselves were to be restructured. Such that then the old symbols that were used to manipulate us would no longer be used and could no longer be f to function in holding us under the control of the European. This is why when we talk about creating changes in our people, we must talk about then the presentation of a total system, not just a jobs program, not just a uh, housing program, or this program. You must offer, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did, a total program that involves housing, religion, education, economics, the total thing, and all of those things wrapped in new symbols and new means for which the people, to which the people can respond, such that then the older system loses its control and power over the personality of the individuals. You see then, because as long as you respond to the old systems, the white liberal as well as the white conservative uses those symbols to manipulate our personality to what they want, to get us to do what they would like for us to do. The next thing that's indicated here in terms of the so-called uh, normal and abnormal individual, self-esteem and self-acceptance. Well-adjusted people have some appreciation of their own self-worth. Very interesting. Of their own self-worth. means that they have a way of measuring themselves that is to a degree independent of the way other people measure themselves. They have a sense of their worth that does not necessarily depend upon what other people say and do in relationship to them. They then see themselves as having an importance and worth and see themselves as being acceptable even when other people may be telling them otherwise. We look at our situation today. Our leadership is one that does not base the self-esteem of black people upon the values and ethics of African people themselves. And this is a major problem that we have. You know, it's sort of like women in the old sense of the word, before women's liberation came along. I am nothing until I get a man. I am nothing until I, what, get a husband. Until I can, what, take his name. I can become 
identified with them. I am not important until I am some way made important through marriage or through identification. It's interesting to note then how much modern so-called black leadership operates with that same thing in mind, with that same approach. I will be nothing until the white man loves me, until the white man accepts me. To a good extent, assimilationism is a form of marriage. We won't be happy and love ourselves until we hook these people into us, until we seduce them to love us. We know that a part of the foundation of the so-called integration movement was not education of black children, because we know two plus two is four anywhere in the world. It's true plus two is four in Harlem. You don't have to go to uh, Long Island to learn that. You don't have to go into a white school to learn two plus two is four. What kind of stupidness is it that tells us that somehow we cannot learn what needs to be learned unless we're sitting next to a white child? Aren't words just words? Aren't these, can't we teach our children what they need to learn wherever they are? But somehow we got an educational leadership, or we got a leadership that says somehow our learning is impaired unless we are sitting with whites. But actually, when we study the history very carefully, we note that the real point of the integration of schools was not that of education of black children, but that of getting black children to love themselves by getting white children to love them. And you remember the old Kenneth Clark experiments, right? The black dolls and the white dolls and how the the black children supposedly didn't want to accept the black dolls and some of them would fall out crying because uh, they saw the black dolls and they wanted the white dolls. You know, they went through this whole thing and the Supreme Court decision was somehow related to this. Indicating then that because these children were not accepted and loved and they were made to think that blackness was a terrible thing, they needed then the love of little white children so that they could get around to themselves. That they were in a sense nothing until they could identify and become one with white people. And consequently then the motivation was to marry these people and to identify with them. And what happens when you marry these people and, and do this? Often the thing happened that happened to many women when they used to operate on this premise. If your status is gained by marriage and not by what you do for yourself, then your energies will be put into seduction. So the woman could spend all of her day combing her hair and, and fixing up her body because this was her tool for getting that man who was going to make her something. She could spend all of her energy shopping and all of her time making sure that her bodily features and so forth were right to seduce a man in one fashion or another. When she engaged in this often, it meant that she ignored many other aspects of her personality. In a sense, she even made herself dumb because many of the men she dealt with didn't like smart women. So either she refused to learn because she figured that would get in her way or she had to act dumb in front of them because she didn't want to insult them. And she found that being smart was a liability. And by being smart, she looked like she was trying to be a man like me. <laughs> you see? And so consequently, often, she had to hide and repress 
many of the other aspects of her personality and leave many areas of her life undeveloped in order to gain acceptance by the so-called men. And when you look at our people, you see this kind of thing with the kind of leadership. If we can identify with the whiteies, like a woman, we can, you know, it says what? In the old days, a woman got the status of a husband, right? So she didn't have to do anything but what? Marry the guy. <laughs> so if he was what? Big time? She was big time because she was his wife. Even though she might not have what? Done anything herself. And many of our people are like that. If we can marry this white man, if we can become identified with this white man, and therefore we will become Mrs. America. <laughs> and therefore we can identify with all of the accomplishments of America. <laughs> not ourselves, not with something that what? We've done on our own. Not with developing our own independent power and personality, but by identifying with these people, we can literally then steal their prestige and their power and become one with them and therefore neglect our own self-development. So many of the assimilationists then are trying the shortcut to prestige, that is through marriage of the European and through identifying the European, and through seduction like a woman. And yet, like many women, what is going to happen? If that man decides to leave you one day, and there you sit, no job skills, don't even know how to write a checkbook, don't even know where to pay the bill because he was so nice to me. He took care of everything. He didn't let me worry about nothing. And now you got ten children and you don't know how to do a thing. Gone. This is why even if we got to live in greatest peace and harmony with this white man, if we as a people, though, have not developed our own potentials and our own power, when this man decides to divorce us, and sometimes in the future, we'll find that we are in worse shape than when we really started. So the point is not to become one and to unify with this white man. The point is to develop our own potential as a people and to develop our own power so that when he decides to walk out on us, we can say, go ahead, hit the road, Jack. And we can go on and deal with it. But our people are made weak by these feminist kinds of leaders that we have today who are not concerned with the development of true black power and independence, but are concerned with the, taking the last name of another people and becoming identified with that other people. A person who uh, has no self-esteem is a person who has no self-confidence, who's frightened of being alone. Many of us are frightened today. What would happen if the white man left us? We would go into the dark ages because we don't think we can invent all these little uh, stereos and all of these other little things that these white folk and the Japanese invent. And so if they weren't in the world, we would really be in bad shape, wouldn't we? We'd have to sit around the campfire and tell each other stories. So then we have to keep them around because we feel that without them, we could not organize and run a world. This is the way we've been made to feel. Much like a woman who feels that without her man, I am nothing. Without you, I'm nobody. Without you, life has no meaning. How can I go on without you? You know, that's that sick love that's projected into our people through this music and this record. Sick, sick love. Very ill. Very ill kind of love. Big, grown, and resting. You can't live without somebody. Take my heart. Here it is. Don't treat me mad. <laughs> How can 
Rebecca, you are a grown person. You're not a babe in arms, even though you like to say it, rock me, babe. You know, and talk little baby talk to me. You know, I'm not against having a nice little time. I love making love. It's wonderful. But then, what I'm trying to get at here is that often people get into a very infantile state of mind when they fall in love. They give up control of themselves. They give up self-responsibility as such. They give up self-definition. They give up their feeling of importance to, to the other person. So therefore, I won't feel important unless you tell me I feel important. Make me feel important. Tell me you love me. <laughs> or else I won't feel right. And this is the way many of our people are. I'm going to make you love me. Yeah, you know, we there some of our leaders like that. I'm going to bug you and worry you until you love me. And many of us feel that we need these other people's love so that we can love ourselves. And therefore we have, and this is why you find many women catching the hell they do with a lot of men. Because they feel, even though that man is kicking their butts, <laughs> and even though the man is abusing them, it's, it's a choice between the lesser of two evils. It would be better than them being by themselves. That somehow they'd be in worse shape than uh, if they were by themselves and being with them. So therefore they have to put up with this abuse. And if they feel that they, they are nothing without this man, then they have to stay with him to feel something even though he's mistreating them. You see? And has no and there's a person in who has no real feeling and, and no real self esteem and self acceptance. And many of our people are in the same situation. We feel we will not be complete until these people love us until they accept us. And therefore we are willing to put up with their abuse because we feel we'd be worse off without them. If they left us then all of this good jazz, this good old stereo music would be gone because we don't know how to make TVs, do we? All these cars would be gone and all this other stuff would be gone because the only we know about Africans is that they produce these things. They produce huts and this and that. So I don't want to live in no hut. I don't want to go back in no jungle. <laughs> so the only thing, so we need these people. We know they treat us mean. We know they, you know, they degrade us sometimes. But uh, hey, it would be worse off if they weren't because niggas can't run nothing, you know. I hate to be in a world where there's all black people. <laughs> you know. And therefore we put up. And we take the abuse. And our only hope then becomes one of trying to convert these people. You see, it's like the woman says, he's nice when he ain't drunk. <laughs> he's so sweet and loving when he ain't got that alcohol. So what does she sit around waiting for? For him to stop drinking. <laughs> so... And by, by the time he stopped drinking, he's beat up to death. You see? And uh, this is the way we get it. By the time this white man learns to love you, you'll be dead. He's be beat it all out of you. Wouldn't be worth loving after that anyway. I'm telling you. Yeah. Oh, we can see. Yeah, she sees how nice he could be. And this is the thing we get caught on. We see how nice it could be if they would love us. Instead of facing the reality that they don't, and facing the possibility of what? That they never will. And dealing with it. And operating on that basis. Instead of living in hopeless hope. Year in and year out. And this is the way we are caught up. We hope someday this drunken fool of a man, these sick people are going to somehow get out of their sickness. And like a weak woman, here you are weak and thinking you're going to transform this man. The worst mistake many women make is to think that they're going to change some man. 
with enough love, <laughs> with enough understanding, you know, <laughs> doesn't happen. It rarely happens, ladies and gentlemen. And here you are, weak people here, and you think you're going to love with enough love and prayer before capital steps and laying down your lives in the army and doing all these sacrificial things that you do. Somehow, that this person is going to see the real you. But you don't recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that this person depends on you being wrong. Don't you understand that? You know, you see the woman, she's being mistreated by the man. And what did she say? Well, what's wrong with me? <laughs> yeah, she sees her what? Herself as the problem. What's wrong with me? And then that be, and now she won't say, well, what? What's wrong with you? <laughs> you must be sick or crazy. You don't know what good thing you got here. Then what does she do? Well, you say I'm too fat. She takes her weight off. You say my hair ain't just too nappy. Then she straightens it up. You say that I don't dress. She puts on a new dress. And what? Every time she makes a step, what happens? It's something else. It's something else. And you know this feeling, black people, because you've been through it, haven't you? What did they tell you about 20 years ago? If you'd only get education. And your parents told you, just get that education. <laughs> you know? And you went out and busted your brain and got the education. Right. And you found out again there was another thing going. Each time you make a move, there's a new demand. You can never get right. Because, ladies and gentlemen, so many people's own ego depends on other people always being what? Wrong. And when their ego and self-perception and their way of life itself depends on you being wrong, they are never going to let you be right. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference what you do. And when you look at the European and the way the European lives upon the backs of our people, and the way the European consumes and eats up the world's resources, and the European style of life, you must recognize then that that style of life depends upon you never being right. And you're never going to be enough and do enough to be accepted by these people because their very life depends upon you being wrong. And you have to recognize that and face it. Then you will stop taking the abuse that is laid upon you by these people and get control of yourself. But when your self-acceptance depends upon their acceptance of you, what will happen if they never accept you as a person? When now you've spent all your time and energy trying to be accepted instead of developing yourself, instead of building up your own potentials, instead of becoming independent of these people, instead of becoming self-defining, when, no matter what you do, ladies and gentlemen, you can jerry your curls all night long. You are not going to be white. I'm telling you. You can, you can, you can three-piece it. You can three-piece it all you want to. You can get your sophisticated language all you want to. You can read all the Shakespeare you want to read. You can keep up with Time magazine. You can read Wall Street Journal. You can do all the things you think they tell you you should do. And you're going to find out you are still just a nigga. In the end. Because his world depends upon you being so. And you're going to find out then why you're getting all of this you're going to leave so many other things undeveloped. So much power. And you have the power, ladies and gentlemen. You have the power. It is the European who is dependent. 
not the African. It is the European who is poor, not the African. One brother mentioned something one day I thought was very interesting when one young lady was talking to him, talked about how poor we were. And he says, can you exploit poor people? Can you take something from poor people? If you're really poor, can you really take something from them? Why is it that other people, Koreans and others, somehow can seem to get something out of these poor black people? How is it that the Europeans can get all of this wealth out of the poor black nations? How is it that the Japanese who live on a rock in the middle of the sea can be wealthy while these poor black nations are starving to death? It is the European that is dependent upon our people. Why is there a struggle in South Africa today? Because Southern Africa represents, as someone described it, the Gold Coast of the minerals that are needed by the Europeans to survive as a nation and as a people. There are minerals and metals and so forth in the southern regions of Africa for which this, which this nation and other European nations cannot live without, ladies and gentlemen. The space age would not be even possible without those metals. If those metals were not gotten into this country, it was stated that we would go, we would reverse our living conditions some 50 years or more. There are metals which Southern Africa produces almost 100% of. And about the only other European controlled nation that has those minerals and metals is, is Russia. And yet we are told that we are dependent as a people. This black people in this United States are called poor people. And yet we know that if you look at the wealth of black people in this country, we are about the ninth or tenth richest nation. But we refuse to think of ourselves as a nation. And we refuse to act as a nation. That is the poverty, not the lack of money. A people who spend five cents out of every dollar for their own people and give 95 cents out of every dollar to another people are not a poor people. And they make other people rich. In the so-called ghetto of Harlem, if you would stop and think, you must recognize that there are billions of dollars pass through that ghetto, day in and day out. Billions. Just think about the absentee landlords who soak up your money. The store owners. The teachers that teach in your neighborhood. The policemen. The other people. Thousands and thousands and millions of dollars being earned and worked right through your fingers. And you're saying you're poor people. You see, a lack of definition. So consequently, when you define yourself in terms of another people's stand standards, you will always come up lacking in something and come up deviant. And it is a pitiful kind of thing because what you see happening in Harlem has happened the world over. You go in parts of Africa, and what are you going to see running the stores? Indians, Muslims, and whatever other number, except African people themselves. Which means the game that is run on the African mind is being run the world over. And yet these are supposed to be poor people. And yet other people are getting rich, working them from one end to the other. 